My name is um, Dr. Brandi Wiegers. I'm at Central Washington University. And today we're gonna talk about the steps to becoming a math superhero. So the first thing, or math and computer science or statistics superhero. So first thing to do is find something that excites you. And so I, I start off with this because um, for me, um, when Jurassic Park and chaos theory first came out, it blew my mind. I got so excited about it. And so I found something that excited me and then I found ways to learn more about it. Um, and so there's two main ways that I really encourage you to take and learn more about the things that excite you. The first is classes. Um, and these are actually my notes from um, in mathematical biology. I had a chance to take and explore my, more about chaos theory, but then on top of chaos theory, I found all sorts of other fun things like fractals and population predator prey models and bifurcation diagrams. And oh my goodness, it was just amazing. Um, and for me, it was the first time that sort of my love of science topics and my love of mathematics found a place where I didn't have to choose which class to take. It was all of it all together in one class. And it was amazing. So I had a class that I enjoyed. I learned more about it. And um, I was never gonna have to decide chemistry or physics again. I could just take a little bit of everything. And so from there, I wanted to take and do more with it. Um, and so as we're thinking about it, I know we don't have many people here today, but as we're thinking about trying to learn more about a math topic or a computer science topic, what sort of experiences can you do out of a class that would take and help you learn more about a particular topic? Can you throw something in the chat? Things that you can take and do out of class that would help you learn more about math or computer science or say something out loud? Well, I'm not getting any answers, so I'm gonna share what I came up with. Um, I have student clubs. Um, I know that our student club um, oftentimes will bring in guest speakers or they talk to different faculty members about like how to get started doing different projects, maybe read a paper together. Um, I would say tutoring is also a great way to take and get um, more exciting math topics. You get to see stuff in other people's classes and also you get much better at teaching the topics that you do know. Sometimes having to explain it to someone else can be a really good way to test how well you understand something. Um, oftentimes there's also opportunities to do math outside the classroom with um, younger students. So maybe do a math festival, volunteer at a math festival or help out with a math circle. And then also research. Um, research can be a really great way to have an out of class experience that really lets you know more about a particular topic. And so that's what we're gonna focus on today is finding out a way to learn more about something and then figuring out something all by yourself. This is one of the most exciting things about research. So as we look at the summer RU programs, um, you can see my slides before, right? Okay. Um, summer RU programs, I think it's important that everyone know what a research experience is. So the Council on Undergraduate Research defines undergraduate research as an inquiry or investigation conducted by an undergraduate student that makes an original intellectual or creative contribution to the discipline. Well, that's a very precise way of saying things, definitely written by some professors. So what do students say research is? Um, well, I have run a couple of research experiences over the summer and our boards look something like this. So definitely a lot of math, a lot of fun. But our students, if I ask them in one word to describe what research is, um, is they said, it's awesome. It's chasing your tail. It's feeling relief. It's directionless and clarifying at the same time. Frustrating, but then there's breakthroughs. It's repetitive, but it's conquered and it's complex. The next year, my set of students from last year said one word was not enough. So they instead wanted up to five words to describe their experience. Um, they said it's perseverance in a new direction. It's productive. It's rewarding. It's straining. It's a lot of writing. 
It's informational. It's stressful, but it's a hard fought process um, that it, they did admit that for them right then in that particular moment, coding was not their favorite thing. But it's disappointment followed by hopefulness, just a balance of confusion and hard fought pargas that leads you ultimately to feeling rewarding. So that's a lot. So at the same time, it's fun. This is my research group from last summer. Um, we had a chance to go to baseball games. We had a chance to go rafting. We had a chance to have picnics. Um, we also had usually a, a cat or dog worked into every single presentation, some sort of mascot to take and support us in our work. So in a lot of ways, I mean, I'm sure right now you're sort of feeling like research, you aren't quite sure what it is, but um, we created um, a, a stuck with it award that recognized people that struggled through all summer. It's just, it's a process of um, excitement and frustration all pulled together. But in the end, there isn't a grade requirement. It's just supposed to be fun. So let's talk about what it actually is like to go to a research experience. This is my program. Um, and the very first thing we talk about is that there's a whole entire team of us that are there to support you. I showed you before that um, you usually have a whole entire group of other undergraduates. In addition to the other undergraduates, um, you have different faculty members. So our team has three faculty members that all support and should be around all summer. Mm -hmm. We also have people um, that take and help us pay the bills and, and get all the paperwork put together. That's our program coordinator. We have somebody that does evaluation, but also is someone that if anything was going wrong with the program that you needed to talk to somebody outside of your faculty members, you can talk to her. That's our, our program evaluator. And we have somebody that has lived at Central before that comes in and plans activities just to take and support you in the event. So we have six people. There's about, um, you know, a two to three um, student to, to one sort of person ratio of just support for you over, over the summer. Um, and what do you actually end up doing at this research experience? Well, our program lasts eight and a half weeks. Um, we meet on our first program on June 22nd and our very last day is August 18th. Um, for those of you on the semester system, that seems really late um, because our program was specifically designed for people on the quarter system. So on the quarter system, I usually don't get out of classes until June 8th and our classes don't start again until September. So this is sort of situated in the middle of our summer. This is probably pretty late for those of you that are in semesters. Um, our last day meeting might be actually the week before you start classes again. That's why you got to look at different REU programs because all of us have slightly different structures. But we also all really meet regularly and get to do really fun science. So this is what our schedule normally looked like. Um, in the mornings, we would get together and um, each one of the individual groups would work together. Mondays, um, we, there would be some sort of presentation from each group. Wednesdays, there would be some form of professional development, whether that was a science talk or um, something where you were working on your personal statement for graduate school. And then Fridays, there'd be some sort of like debrief and fun checkout process, um, some sort of just way to say, I felt successful after this week, and this is what I'm looking forward to for next week. Um, we tended to keep most of our meetings between nine and five, um, but that doesn't work for all the students' schedules. Some of them preferred to sort of sleep in and work later. Again, that sort of worked, especially towards the end of the summer when everyone was making individual progress. Keep going the wrong way. Um, between nine and five, what we were usually doing was doing some sort of mathematical or professional or community-based project. We, of course, were supporting our biological needs. There was lunch breaks. There was just go out and walk in the sun breaks. But we also had fun, and we supported each other as various life things happened. Um, so 
yes, we were meeting and working regularly, but also um, we weren't robots. We were also having lots of fun. During that time, we were reading math books or reading math articles, um, and then trying to summarize the books that we read, trying to recreate the results, thinking about how we might do things differently, working to do it differently, having it not work, try it all over again, um, and then presenting those results. Oftentimes that meant that we were on computers, we were on the internet, um, we went through lots of, of papers, um, all of our rooms that we work in have um, glass windows and so we like write on them in whiteboard markers um, and we also regularly had coffee tea ice cream and when it got really warm outside we went through lots of popsicles so lots of fun um that said we also as i said had a peer mentor um kieran took and planned events every single week so our students went hiking or rafting um, they had cookouts, um, they went and did karaoke. Um, it was supposed to be, this is 12 people that you're very, very close to all summer. It was really a great chance to just be social and do math. So all of this sounds like fun, but also isn't done for free. We actually do pay all of our students to take and come to our program. Um, we basically are able to give each one of our students $1,000 every two weeks. Um, and that comes from the National Science Foundation. Um, we have a grant which allows us to do this. Um, other programs um, might only be able to pay you a stipend or might only pay for your room and board. Um, every single program is slightly different, but this is something that you need to know in regards to how they're gonna pay you. Like, are you gonna have to wait until August to get any payment? That's something that you need to check out as you're looking at a program. In addition, um, it's, it's not paid as an hourly wage, which could be really different than jobs that you worked other summers. Um, it's possible that um, you will not have any taxes removed um, and that you'd have to pay taxes on that later on. So that's gonna be something that you're gonna need to keep track of and that would affect, for example, your FAFSA. So these are things to um, talk to your um, academic advisors at your school about in regards to how this financial support would impact them. Um, I also am very proud of the fact that we all not only pay for you to come out in the summer, we also pay for you to go to a conference after our REU. Um, but this is one of the things that's the most different for most students. Um, these are all things that have to go through the university bureaucracy process. So all of it has to be pre-approved um, and triple checked <laughs> before you're allowed to do it. But it does mean that you have insurance when you take and go to those conference events. And um, oftentimes you'll be reimbursed for both your hotel and your travel to attend the conference. Okay. So what I'm telling you is that research experiences for undergraduates are your chance to take and go to a campus that's not your own to get paid for the summer, um, to take and um, you know, have a lot of fun. We're gonna take and run another session in a couple of months that's gonna talk about like what you should bring and how to get prepared for the actual experience. But, but these are chances to take and do lots and lots of fun work. What do you actually do when you're at the conference though? Or, oh, nope, maybe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause this for a second. Okay, stop share. Um, it seems like I can recognize some of the names here. So um, as you are looking at what I've presented so far, does that line up with what your experience is with research experiences for undergraduates? Asib says yes. Okay. Um, does it sound like fun? Okay, Phyllis, it's new to you. Of course, it's, it's fun. They are, I mean, it's a great way to take and spend your summer. I really, really enjoy it. So um, Phyllis, if this is sounding like fun, let's figure out how you would actually take and apply for an REU, okay? So the very first thing that you need to know is you need to be able to take and find the programs. 
So there's a lot of different ways that you could take and find um, RU programs across the country. Um, first of all, um, I would also suggest that you talk with your academic advisor. Your academic advisor might know of research experiences at your own campus that you can do that summer without having to move. Um, so talking to them about experiences also over the spring, that would also be really great for you. So talking about how you can get paid to do research on your campus. Next, um, there's several different online sites. So the National Science Foundation has a list of um, all of the REU sites that they fund. So the nice thing about this is any NSF funded REU has a minimum stipend of $500 a week. So you have to receive $500 a week. And um, they're very nicely sorted. So I'm gonna choose computer um, science. And so you can see that these are a list of all of the ones. They're done alphabetically across the country of um, RU programs. Um, in fact, there's four pages of them. And so maybe this is a little bit too much. You can take and, um, oh, I'm sorry. You can download um, all of them. And I'm gonna share with you what that looks like as soon as it opens up, you share. So this is what that looks like. Um, again, a little bit overwhelming, um, but you can see over here, the name of the university that's sponsoring the program, what the RU is actually called. So um, we are at Central Washington University. Our program is called Central Convergence REU. Um, right here, you can see um, the site for the program, the, the link for the program. And um, you'll see different topics that um, the program plans to take and plan on. So um, if we were wanting to take and do artificial intelligence, um, I could look for all of the REUs that are focused on artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, and those would, could be the ones that I applied for. Okay. If you had questions about the program, it also lists the program director and gives you um, somebody to take in contact. Okay. So going back to this one, um, let me just show you like where ours is. So this is, um, we are at, well, that's embarrassing. Well, we should be here. Um, we're at Central Washington University. And so um, it, it should be listed on here. I will double check with them. But let's say that you were interested in the SUNY New York program. Um, you would leave this particular page to go and visit them. And you can see that applications are open. Um, you can see who is gonna be doing programs this summer. Um, these are mentors that you would have a chance to work with. Um, and people that you'd have a chance to do research related to their work. So in this particular case, Dr. Soberon is interested in combinatorics, algebraic topology and linear algebra. And um, we can see what the students have done in the past, right? So this is a graph theory problem. It looks like somehow they did something related to sunflowers, just all sorts of really fun things. Um, if you, we wanted to take and actually see what it would be like to take and apply for this program, it see, says that um, we are going to take and submit it at mathprograms.org, which is the next thing I was going to show you. And you need a reference letter, a resume, a cover letter, a transcript, and anything else. So um, that was going to be the list of things that I, I think that you need for an application. So you're gonna need an application essay, um, a resume, 
or um, CV. And um, letters of recommendation, copy of a transcript, and then program specific material. Let's go see what it actually looks like on mathprograms.org. Um, you are going to be a program applicant. So you create a new account. And then from there, you'd actually be able to take and um, um, apply for the program. It's going to Sorry, security. So um, you can't take and see the list of programs available until you've actually taken and um, logged in. Once you've logged in um, as somebody that wants to apply for programs, you can take and see um, on this page um, all of the different programs. So um, it is a little bit confusing. For example, this is a PhD program and this is an REU program. So you are going to want to use the search feature and really focus on um, trying to take and find REU programs. Um, so undergraduate programs. And this is the list of all of the undergraduate programs that have paid um, to take and use um, the AMS services to run their applications this summer. So a great variety of programs. And you can definitely use that to take and look at oh, I only want to do this in Pacific Northwest or only want to do this in the state of Florida, right? You'd be able to narrow down and be able to figure out where you want to take and do a program. Okay, somebody wrote something in the chat. Great question, Dehan, um, in regards to if there's programs for DACA students. Um, I would say that most of those um, are not going to be listed on the NSF site. Um, those, those NSF ones are only for um, US citizens. Um, the uh, place that I would recommend looking at for REU sites that might be able to support DACA students is the Math Alliance program. Um, the Math Alliance program specifically is focused on diversifying racially the, the PhD programs. And so these are a list of summer programs that um, are affiliated with, um, with the Math Alliance and they'd be more likely to be able to support um, DACA students. Um, I believe that the MSRI up does have like a sub grant that lets them do one DACA support a year. Um, but yes, DACA students are not technically eligible for the NSF funding. It has to come from um, a um a, an outside foundation grant so msri has daca support from an outside foundation um but but you'd have to check in with each individual program in regards to who has daca funding um, okay so um as i said the um, Math Alliance is specifically a, a site of, of REUs affiliated with the, the mission of um, the Math Alliance, which is to diversify the um, racially um, the, the math PhD, like who is becoming mathematicians. And so these are a great program, especially to think about if you have students um, that are traditionally underrepresented in the field of math. These are going to be programs that are prepared to support those students so that they aren't feeling isolated um, over the summer, um, like they're the only one um, at that program. I think these are these are programs with mentors that are really committed to supporting um, full student process. Um, and then finally, there is one more set of locations that I know of to take and find um, programs. Um, and that is an informal list um, maintained by a group of people that run our use. So this is a set of faculty that all just work together over the summer to run our use. And every single year they just have people email in. So sometimes there might be slightly different ones listed on here um, than there would be on the other sites. So a little bit too much place, too many places you can go look. Um, but they, um, they, they work to keep everything updated. 
They have the deadlines um, when the program is actually going to run, as well as the deadlines for the program. So definitely worth checking out. So you decided that you want to apply to the Boise State University data-driven security. Oh, nope, you can't. That one's too late. These ones are all too late. So let's find a different one. You want to apply to the Rice University program and data science. What are you actually going to need to apply to their program? Well, as we said before, um, we've seen this. You're going to need some sort of reference level or a cover letter. Um, so what are you actually going to write about? Um, I find for most students, this is the most overwhelming thing. We are asking you to write an essay about you, and, and there's too much blank space, too many things that you could write about. So um, I actually thought we could take about five minutes today um, if there were students here. Um, it looks like there isn't any students. Is there? Phyllis, are you a student? Okay. Hey, no, I'm 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 a program director for psychology. Perfect. Okay. I'm actually I'm cool. actually here kind of sleuthing and learning so that I can share this with uh, others in my school of sciences. Because I think Perfect. this is this is new opportunities for our students because our students are fully online. Oh yeah, this and is, there's our campus is, things. you yeah. know, our campus is online. So I'm looking to start building cognizance and awareness of research opportunities for our students. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, then what I'm gonna say is students, if we do have students watching this video later, what I'm gonna suggest is I'm gonna post um, a topic and I recommend that you think about, you pause the video, write about that for five minutes and then restart the video and go from there. Um, so for application essays, um, what I typically recommend is sort of four parts to your cover letter or application essay. First, I think you should tell us a bit about yourself. Explain your background in mathematics and experience you have in research and problem solving. Um, so maybe that's gonna be, um, I just took this mathematical biology class. It blew my mind. Um, I think that predator prey models are so cool and I'm so looking forward to taking and learning about more math. That's gonna be really exciting. Um, as you are doing this, one of the reasons that you're gonna start off your essay this way is that um, sort of compared to your previous experiences um, as an undergraduate where you're applying for things um, to sort of be recognized, when you are applying for research experience for undergraduates, you are applying to come and spend the summer with a, a mentor you are gonna take and be our colleague for the summer. And so we are looking for someone that we're like, oh, I wanna spend the summer with this person. Um, so this is your chance to take and sort of, and like, let us know that you're a person that um, we really wanna spend the summer with. Why do I explain that? Well, one of the ways that most of my students will start this essay is the first thing that they write down is, I always hated math until, and I'm gonna tell you that when I am on an airplane and someone asks me what I do, and I say that I do math, the very first thing that they say to me is I always hated math. So when I read that sentence, I have an emotional reaction to it because I just, I get, I, I want everyone to love math. And so instead I am looking to take and relate to you in a way that we both love math. We both are excited about this. So as you started your essay with, I always hated math and tell, just take that sentence out and just tell me about what makes you love math. What makes you excited? What made you sort of code your first CS thing? The first time you said, hello world, how did it feel, right? Tell me the positive things. Tell me the things that make you enthusiastic and excited, um, the things that make you wanna do more of these things. After you've done that, I think that um, one of the next things that you can take and do is describe an enjoyable experience in depth that you've had doing that. So don't just say, um, I've always, I liked this and this and this and this. Tell me what um, creating a predator prey model and coding it all in Mathematica and then seeing the results, what was that actually like? 
if you had a chance to take and present about Fibonacci numbers, tell me what was really impressive to you when you got to mention you know, a fact that you learned about Fibonacci numbers or when you found out that Euler and you had both thought the same about a particular problem, right? We're having a moment that you have en enjoyed math, enjoyed computer science, enjoyed stats. Tell me about it. Then tell me why you wanna do this. Um, you are gonna be doing this for eight and a half weeks over the summer. It's a lot of work. So tell me why you're actually interested in participating in this research experience. This might involve reading about what past students have done, saying like, oh, I really wanna try this game and explore it with other people, or I have this question about this game, or it can be how it personally relates to you. Um, the research I work on over the summer is related to um, modeling the female hormone system related to female menstruation. And I've had students that had family members in their life that had cervical cancer. And it was really interesting to them to try to make that connection about what had happened in their family's life to the mathematics that we were doing over the summer, right? That was something that they were able to make a personal connection to. So why are you interested? And then finally, tell me how you've persisted and committed to academic endeavors. So um, like, don't just tell me like, oh, this was just so hard, but telling me how did you overcome it? How did you work with friends? How did you read a book and find a different perspective? How did you try it and then go and visit a professor's office and learn about it differently? How did you overcome a challenge or an obstacle? Because that's what you're gonna spend a lot of the summer doing is overcoming challenges, overcoming obstacles, and then working at it from different angles. So that would be like the basic start to an application essay. Once you've had it started, I'm gonna take and recommend two steps to you. I just, I'm so sorry. Um, so I just, I realized that we should, we should add this in. So, Once you have, um, once the letter, once the essay is done, what I would recommend is show it to the people who are writing your letters of recommendation. Recommendation. They are going to be able to give you feedback in regards to ways that you can take and improve it with specific focus. And it's going to help them write better as letters of recommendation. I also really recommend that you use the career services or writing center on campus to read over your essay um, to give you grammatical feedback. Um, oftentimes, they're going to take and have tools to take and improve your essay and just make sure that um, it reads and has the most engagement. You notice I said letter writers. Um, every single application that process that I've seen requires some sort of person that can talk about what it's like to do math or science or computer science with you. And so it's important that you find faculty members that can take and do that. They should be people that can describe you as a person, not just like, hey, this student took my class and got an A, but what is it like? How were you a leader in the class? How did you problem solve or, or support the, the class environment? Um, did you give a really cool presentation in the class? What were something that makes you stand out in a class of many students? And so um, when I try to tell students to find this person, um, if you aren't quite sure, start going to people's office hours and asking them in person. Say, Dr. Kazi, could you write me a letter of recommendation? I'm applying for this thing. Do you think that you'd be able to? I can give you my CV and my cover letter, and then um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. So you're going to do it nicely. You're going to ask, not just require. And I would say give people as much time as possible. It usually takes me about two weeks to write a letter, a good letter of recommendation. I can do it in an hour, but it's better if you give me two weeks. It's even better if you give me one month. 
I would say one month is ideal. And after you've asked me, once I've agreed, it is totally fine to nag me if I haven't told you that I turned it in. So Dr. Brandy, that letter of recommendation is due tomorrow, just so you don't forget. Dr. Brandy, that letter of recommendation is due this afternoon. Do you have any questions about it? That is totally fine. It's totally acceptable to follow someone up that has agreed to write you a letter of recommendation and ask them um, about whether or not they've completed that letter. This is your career, it's your professional opportunity. It's totally acceptable to ask people. But it's also very appropriate to thank them after they have finished those letters and just let them know that they have done a great service for you. So that is the basic process of applying for this. It's possible that different ones will have slightly different processes, but um, that's the basic information. If you write a really good essay, you can adjust it to um, different programs. And, and that was the main thing that I wanted to talk about today is once you've found something that you're really excited about, once you've had a chance to take and explore it in class and out of class, you'll have a chance for the first time to like describe something that somebody else has never thought about. Um, I had a chance to do a couple REUs um, on the top when I was um, a junior. I got to go to Erie, Pennsylvania. And that was me teaching a computer how to make um, animated roses. Um, I was pretty excited about that. And then down here on the bottom was actually work that I did in prostate cancer cell research. Um, first of all, it took me all summer to be able to say the word prostate without giggling. So I was really proud of that. Um, but also it was work that ultimately got published um, being able to take and use a computer detection system to take and look at um, prostate cancer cell biopsies um, and figure out um, the, the, the um, grading of the um, prostate cancer section. And there's a rubber duck next to it um, because when I had to train the lab assistant to take and do the computer process when I left, um, I did the whole entire handbook using a rubber duck um, as an example um, for how to take and do all the work. And I, I thought that was hilarious. So that is my basic summary and I'm happy to address any questions. Um, I had hoped to be able to talk with students today. And so um, I'm, I apologize because I feel like I ended a little early, but I'm also happy to address questions from anyone that might want to talk about how you talk with your students about this. I guess allow me to uh, chime in here. Um, I feel that um, I needed to uh, kind of appreciate you and say a few uh, words about uh, the good job that Dr. Brandy Wiegers has been doing as chair of the um, our Mathematical Computing and Statistical Sciences Seminar Series. She has done a uh, phenomenal job in contacting several good uh, speakers, scholars, including herself. She's a published scholar and very well known in her field. And we are basically fortunate to have her as an officer in our division. So um, that I needed to say that at the start, but I think it's probably reasonable and then um, I'll give the opportunity to others if they want to ask any questions after that. I might have uh, two or three minor questions for the sake of learning. Please, and, and thank you very much for that introduction. I apologize for should have done that. Thank you, Phyllis. I see that um, one of our other worthy members of the division, uh, Dr. Dehan Kiwak is there and Dr. Rose, hopefully we are crossing our fingers and looking forward to having you soon, formally and um, well, uh, 
Dr. Wiegers, my uh, question is, uh, since you, you understand that middle schools and high schools, they are kind of uh, nurseries for the undergraduate lot. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like uh, on national level, especially as Kerr, are we doing enough uh, to highlight, highlight uh, research opportunities to high school students, seniors and juniors, so that uh, they in the near future are appropriately exposed to undergraduate research opportunities because my feel is if they come prepared uh, with a mind maybe they can continue that re research and be more productive so you think that at national level and uh, through curse platform we are doing something are you satisfied that with that or do you think we need to reach out more to high school juniors and seniors as well. Do you see any value in that? So um, I'm gonna address this. I, I can only really address this through the, the field of mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You'll see that this slide that I chose to pick up is um, sort of this step three. And I think um, one of the, the biggest disservices we do to any students is sort of trying to keep on putting off this particular step. Um, I think that we, we find something that excites students, um, find ways to learn more about it. And then um, oftentimes, if it doesn't fit the algorithm of, of sort of what we need to do in order to keep a class moving forward, um, mm -hmm. it can be really hard to give students the opportunity to find things for themselves and to really have that, that process of discovery. And so um, one of the things that I support outside of undergraduate research is um, mathematical outreach and enrichment to take and just provide more opportunities for students to discover things um, for themselves. And mm -hmm. maybe the technical name might be Euler characteristic, but if, if they get to discover it for themselves first, um, I think it's, it's so much better than just saying like the equation for this is V minus E plus two F right like minus plus f is equal to two right like i think that there's an opportunity there um in regards to how that specifically plays out with Kerr, um i have less ideas um um there but i do know that for our region we've spent a lot of time recently mm -hmm. thinking less about the the middle school high school transition and more about sort of community college to undergraduate um like to r1 r2 pui institution transitions um because i think um for our university so many of our students are, are transfer students um that that we really want to make sure that they've heard about it before they come to our university because they only spend two years at our university and i'd hate you for you to like not learn about it until may of your first year and then that only gives you a year when you could have done two years of research, right? Two years of figuring things out for yourself. And so I think for us, we're putting that energy into the community college transition um, to make sure students are able to start at the community college and then continue doing work once they, they transfer to our school. That sounds reasonable. And my motivation for this question, I know you are very involved with the Mathematical Association of America and up to some extent, um, I am also involved in volunteer and service activities. So as you see um, from within the previous few years, AMS has started uh, putting a lot of emphasis on reaching out to high schools and middle schools. even. They started competitions and a lot of things and offering perks, uh, different divisions, I mean, uh, sections are offering perks to high school students and teachers, like a free meeting registration. So uh, that is, uh, MAA is aware of that and they are kind of working on that. As Kerr, I, I maybe we can sit together at a point and discuss what we can do. Um, if you allow me, I have another little question, which is about just the data. Uh, yeah that you can quote maybe. 
So in your uh, personal opinion, uh, what is the percentage of undergraduate students uh, who graduate four-year college without taking part in any type of REU uh, or without making a single presentation outside of their own institution? Can you quote based on your own experience, like more than 75% graduate I, without or something like that? Um, so I, I don't know exactly. I can talk about my university. Um, mm -hmm. When I first got here, none of our students had ever even presented mathematics. Um, so that's something that we changed in our, our major. So now all students m present mathematics multiple times before they graduate. Sometimes that means they're presenting research. Sometimes that means they just are doing independent projects. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say from our graduating seniors over the last several years, more than 75% did not do a research experience for undergraduates of any form, whether it's during the academic year or during the school or summer. And um, most of them have never presented at, a, at an external conference. I would say for our university, everyone that did a research experience did present at an external conference. That's something that we've worked really hard to make sure happened. That kind of answers my question. Yeah, it has been um, of great interest to me. And um, I, I kind of agree with you um, what my analysis at national level, if you look at all two, four year, in like PhD granting institutions, undergrads go there and take classes. But uh, I think probably we have been able to motivate uh, only the top 25% people at this point, but uh, things will uh, look better, I think, in the near, near future with our collective efforts like a AMS, MAA, uh, CUR, we are jointly do as you are also trying to promote this through uh, MAA's uh, platform through your special interest group. And, yep. and I appreciate you uh, for that as well. You are probably the founding uh, founding chair of that or? Sigma? No, I was not. Um, you I came in after they founded, yeah. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Is, is that is Lauren going to be, Professor Rose going to be the chair? Yeah, uh, so, I, so I'm I, the chair right now and, and Lauren will be the chair next year. Yeah, that's we. Yeah, we are looking forward to working with her. And well, these are all of uh, my questions. If any other. So, what is the level expressed interest in RE programs? Are the opportunities fully leveraged? Um. So, Phyllis, this is a great question. Um. To to. Um. In my experience, talking with other um, undergraduate research um, directors through the listserv, um, oftentimes um, they have been able to fill all of their programs. But something that we have noticed post pandemic is that there's just much less applications and much less diversity in the applications. So that was one of my main goals of doing this is I think that um, most of the students in the past have heard about these opportunities in hallway conversations, if um, we're honest. And I think that that needs to change so that we're providing more equal access to students um, all hearing about what an REU is and make sure that um, that it's not just going to the one or two like brightest kids in the class are the ones that answer the fastest, but that that I think there's a good variety of people out there that would all benefit from it. Um, I know for myself, it was the, the doing an RE was the main thing that developed my mathematical identity and feeling like I could do math. Um, so what has been your biggest challenge, any one challenge that, that you wanted to mention in this REU adventure? Um, I think we really thought um, that regionally we were filling a need um, and we just aren't seeing the regional application. So that was our main goal of trying to, um, I feel like um, in the past when I was working on doing one with just our school, um, 
a lot of our students didn't want to travel across the country um, for cultural and family reasons. And so we are trying to create a program to meet a cultural regional need of not having to travel and um, those students just aren't hearing about it. So we wanted to make sure, because um, especially for my students that have family commitments um, over the summer, I think it, it's really difficult for them if we live in Washington to be in Florida. Um, I think um, that they're able to go home every once in a while if they live in Washington and um, are doing the work in Washington. Thank you, Dr. Vega, for taking time to answer my questions in great details. Uh, floor is open for other questions if they any any worthy attendee wants to ask. Hi, this is Phyllis again. I, I have one more question that um, I think would be of use to students, and that is, what is you mentioned that stipends or their is a propensity for paid opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, how well is that expressed and how much information do students have in advance so that they can take these that into consideration? Um, it should be on each, each site. Um, so let me see if I can bring up ours. Um, so, um, participant support is, is how I choose to take in and communicate ours. Um, and everyone should have some form of listing of that um, available on the site. Um, in addition, if you go to like the NSF listing, it, it's part of the requirements that, that it be posted. So um, any of the ones that are NSF listed should um, have requirements. Um, have at least $500 a month. Um, that said, as a mentor to somebody that has um, supported other students going to REUs across the country, I think it's really important that you um, talk with your students about where they're applying and make sure that they're prepared for the location. Um, I had a student that um, grew up in a county that had one stop sign, one stoplight, I apologize. So a very, very small town. And um, from there, um, they came to, so coming to our small town, our small college town was like a, felt like a big, big city experience. And they got accepted to an REU in San Diego and then asked to find their own housing. Um, so I spent a lot of time um, in the month or two before she went preparing her to, like she, she didn't have a smartphone, she'd never traveled on a bus before but just trying to make sure that she was ready to make that transition um, and, and find housing um, that wasn't a scam and that was successful. So um, I, I would say that um, Phyllis, as, as a mentor to, to these students, um, for me, it's a two-part process is one, it's getting them to apply. And second part is getting them there and making sure that they understand how to work with the other adults um, that are gonna be there to support them. Those are excellent points. I really appreciate the insights. Yeah. So, and then also my my point to other directors was, please just don't make my students find housing in San Diego <laughs> over the summer. So that was my I, I did send that as as a as a thought to those adults as well. So, so. so Dr. Medina, are you from Psychology Division? Yes, I am. Oh, thank you so very much for joining us. This means a lot to us. You know, that was one of the big purposes to kind of uh, bring us together and learning from each other's experiences and see if we could do a bigger collective good to occur, uh, joining our forces and our minds together. So we thank you very much for, you know, uh, giving us this honor attending our Dr. Brandy. I was, I was excited to find the opportunity, and I do plan on communicating with others within the uh, School of Arts and Sciences and our science department, what I learned today. And likewise, we would love to, basically, if you have good practices and things, we would love to learn from you as well. I mean, that's, you specialize in your areas, so uh, a good mix of knowledge and cross-pollination, that's what 
uh, brings or makes a better and stronger impact 